This is Rosa Shaw, and I'm here to guide you through the daily activities, events, and the ins and outs of what occurs on the street. So sit back, relax, enjoy your cup of coffee, purchase one with some popcorn bucks, and enjoy a word from the metaverse. Harosha Shive here, speaking to you from a small cafe adjacent to the famous Black Sun Bar, giving you, giving you the latest on what is happening on the street and what is affecting our world here in the metaverse. This is episode 17, Don't Kid Yourself and Do not do not Fool Yourself. Blackout Day, Save the Internet, uh, July 12th, uh, Net Brutality Day. Uh, we're going to discuss uh, these particular forms of protests, uh, Blackout Day, which is something that has been pretty much the the actual uh, first time event where we talk about it, but the actual tactic has been around since pretty much the advent of the internet in and of itself. We talk a little bit about, uh, say, the internet July 12th, uh, Net Neutrality Day. We talk about the different companies and organizations behind that and uh, what it could all mean. Eventually, uh, after July 12th, maybe a week after a particular protest, uh, we will uh, discuss some of the aftermath and maybe a couple of weeks for us to get a full scope of understanding of the aftermath of the net neutrality. Again, um, we'll get into that when we talk about the episode, but uh, just kind of give you kind of an idea or where, or where, uh, awareness of you know future episodes of, of a word of, from the meta. So the news. Amazon Bebo's disrupts another frontier with just one tweet. Uh, we'll have a, a little bit of a discussion, one of our manifestos. I wish I had a discussion, but one of our manifestos uh, the manifesto I'm reading for this episode will be about Twitter, but this was just something funny. Uh, by Tom Mancloth and Brendan Coffey. This is from Bloomberg Pursuits. Uh, his message seeking philanthropic uh, uh, charity ideas draws 4, 000, uh, 42,000 replies. It turns heads in an area chide for stodgy foundations. So here's the danger sometimes of asking Twitter. Amazons.com Inc.'s uh, Jeff Bezos has remained largely invisible in the world of uh, philanthropy. That changed last week in a single tweet followed by 42k more. The tycoon's request to Twitter asking how can he best use his wealth to help people quote unquote right now has set up a frenzy of responses from every corner of the world. They include pleas to support healthcare, education, and loan forgiveness, offbeat appeals to back a leather fetish museum in Chicago, plus Marky demands to reboot favorite TV shows. Even Madonna chimed in, inviting the world's second richest man to visit Detroit to engage with char- charities there. So this is a tweet. This tweet is a quest for ideas. I'm thinking about a philanthropy strategy that is an opposite of how I mostly spend my time, working on the, on the long term. For philanthropy, I, I find I am drawn to the other end of the spectrum, the right now. As one example, I'm very inspired and moved by the work done at May, Mary's Place here in Seattle. I like long term and it's a huge lever. Blue Origin, Amazon, Washington Post, and all of these are contributing to society and civilization in their own ways. But I'm thinking I want much of my philanthropy activity to be helping people here and now in short term at the intersection of the urgent need and lasting impact. If you have ideas, just reply to this tweet with your idea. And if you think this approach is wrong, we'd love to hear that too. Thanks, Jeff. So it's a longer tweet because he, he captioned, um, a, you know, took a picture and posted the tweet, if you will, of his writings. So the unusual public approach bears a stamp of Silicon Valley disruption and is turning heads in a realm that usually enlists consultants and experts to parcel out big dollar gifts. Uh, seeking ideas on Twitter as such shows Bezos acting like a venture, a venture capitalist scouring proposals in hope of finding a few worthy investments, says Alina Heisman, chief executive officer of the National Philanthropic Trust, a charity that manages $4.2 billion on behalf of individual philanthropists. The crowdsourcing strategy could signify an expansion of Bezos' readily restrained approach of philanthropy. The Bezos Family Foundation was best known for support of children's education, as largely funded by his parents from Amazon's holdings they acquired as an early investor in their son's enterprise. Outside of that, Bezos and his family's known donations have totaled about $100 million, including gifts to Princeton University, Seattle's Fred Hutchinson's Cancer Center Research, according to the Chronicle of Philanthropy. That pales in comparison to the billions of dollars donated by Bill Gates and Warren Buffett. And then I'm going to quote some of the, not all the tweets here, but here's a couple that I think are important. I'm going to read some of the article, but some of the tweets that people have been putting in the article here. But everybody's been watching to see when he would get into the Flampton game, what he would do, and then how he would do it, says Stacey Palmer, editor of the Chronicle of Philanthropy. Given what he did with Amazon, I don't think it surprised anybody that's doing it in an untraditional way. Bezos amassed an $86 billion fortune while building Amazon to the world's largest online retailer. Just after hours after his tweet, he announced the company's takeover 
with organic grocer rolls uh, Whole Foods Force Mark Whole Foods Foods Market Incorporated and he's been tight lipped since. He hasn't yet responded to any suggestions, nor has he indicated publicly how much he intends to donate or when it might start. Amazon and the Bezo Family Foundation didn't respond to requests for comment. So shout out to Rain of April here. Help pay off student loans. They keep uh, so many from raising their credit score, getting a better job, buying a home or car. Instant impact. Charlie Bess. Here are the 30K most urgent needs of American teachers who are uniquely positioned to make a lasting impact. DonorsChoice.org. And while lesions on Twitter are eager to help him decide, some of his peers are cautioned against the approach. The most effective philanthropy is targeted, said Irish billionaire Dennis O'Brien, whose Digest Foundation is the largest builder of schools in the Caribbean. You will get thousands of replies, but at the end of the day, you do, you do things that are strategic and you do things that are interested. You could be overwhelmed with choices and ideas. Other billionaires are more residents. Not for me to tell him what to do with his money, says Leon Koperman, who has pledged to give away the majority of his, his $2.3 billion fortune in response to an email from Bloomberg. Several other wealthy philanthropists contacted for comment didn't respond or declined to weigh in. Uh, Zuckerberg's approach. To be sure, other technology entrepreneurs have put twists on plan of philanthropy. Uh, Facebook uh, incorporated Max Zuckerberg and his wife, Marcella Chan, who pledged to give away 99% of their $63 billion stake in their social network, are challenging their efforts with a limited liability company. That gives the couple more flexibility than a traditional foundation. For example, they don't have to give to charity every year and can make investments in political donations. Uh, Sean Parker, who has a $3 billion net worth, is using a cancer research institute he funded to the tune of $250 million to overturn traditional research practices. On um, was uh, we'll see how this. You know, I'm sure we're gonna all find out what it is that he does. But the response is, and you can find it on Twitter and under his. You can search him out. And he is um, Jeff Bezos, and it's checkmarked. Uh, all the different types of responses to his tweet, and I'm sure he's still even now getting responses to it. But it was just very, very funny and very entertaining. And uh, Twitter had a bit of a moment, if you will. But it, it seemed very overwhelming. There was a lot of jokes thrown in, but there was a lot of serious, serious um, responses of the, the different things that he could do with his wealth. And it's just very fascinating um, as someone saying, hey, I have this X amount of dollars or money or, you know, you know who I am and I want to do this type of thing. Give me some ideas. So it'll be interesting. Hopefully, maybe by the end of the year, we might have some type of update. But. It was just it was just a little weird bit of the news, and it was very entertaining. Um, if you were on Twitter on that on that day to see uh, the timeline going going through a bit of a bit of a fun, if you will. So Google is funding the creation of software that writes local news stories. This is by TechCrunch by Brian Heater. Uh, Google with his Google is trying so hard to get these chatbots and AI programs going and not all of them are turning out so great for them but here we go google's digital news in initiative has committed uh, eight hundred fifty thousand dollars to fund an automated news writing initiative for uk-based news agency the press association the money will help pay for the creation of radar reporters to data and robots snappily named software designed to generate upwards of thirty thousand local news stories a month the Press Association has enlisted UK-based news startup uh, Yerbus Media for the task of creating a piece of software that turns news data into a palpable content. Once up and running, the team is hoping the software will be able to fill in some of the gaps that are currently being underserved as the universally financial strain being experienced by new users around the world deepens. It's similar to the model the Associated Press has employed for a while now here in the States, mostly tackling financial and niche sports stories. A quick Google news search of the Telltale Tagline, the story was generated by an automated insight, reveals it hits from news outlets across the U.S. And a news release heralding the financial commitment. Press Association Editor-in-Chief Peter Clifton called the move a genuine game changer, stressing that the partnership will focus on stories that might otherwise be written up as local newspapers continue to die off in the massive fourth estate extinction. Of course, he was also quick to add that the move will do away with the human touch entirely. Skilled human journalists will still be vital in the process, he explained. But radar allows us to harness artificial intelligence to scale up to a volume of local stories that would be impossible to provide manually. People will be involved in the creation and editing of the stories and hopefully help limit the possibilities of accidentally publishing incorrect information and error when fake news is an equal barbed insult on the size of the political spectrum. Were the product writers replacing or simply support 
the work of their human counterparts, a little bit of both probably. Human news writers regularly point out that the AIs tend to lack nuance in the flair for language and the stories they turn out. That's probably a fair cr- criticism. But it's easy to see how the rise in robotic news could be a justification, if not a great cause for further job loss in the industry. If writers are going to be let go anyway, surely having some software to fill in the gap will help cushion the blow. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, <laughs> it's going to be an interesting project, um, especially with the UK also going through this bout of fake news there. And they have a totally different type of media system uh, than here in the States. Um, well, good luck to them and Google. It might work out. It could be this, you know, partnership. Uh, we had a story a while back at, that we talked about a software program that was able to go through all the different legal briefs and churn out the appropriate documents that lawyers need to do um, for a particular case. Uh, I think there was like 60,000 documents and they were able to, the AI was able to do it in an hour, which would have taken like, I forgot how many lawyers or what it was involved, but all the hours and lawyers necessary to do the same amount of work, it was done in a very brief amount of time comparatively and it allowed them to get the appropriate information and, and build their cases. Uh, so it would be interesting to see if that's something that's going to be very similar to what's going on here with this uh, robotic news writing. Well, that's it for the news. Um, a little update, and then we'll get into the heart of the story about um, a little bit about the history of slowing down or blacking out the internet, if you will. So a little mini update before we get into the episode. Uh, this comes from Motherboard. Uh, the U.S. government wants to permanently legalize the right to repair. So we talked about the right to repair and the struggle and how uh, the, the farmers are pretty much the biggest pushers to allow for you for anyone to be able to repair uh, their media devices, basically their software devices, their computers. Uh, for primarily, it, was, it has to do with the struggle with John Deere and being able to fix their John Deere tractors, and they were unable to do it because of the proprietary software they're uh, either unable to directly access it, you have to use black market um, systems to bypass so they can repair it or uh, update it themselves, um, going through all these different types of hood, uh, loops and hoops, if you will, to be able to repair their, their tractor because John Deere says that that while you own the actual physical hardware, you don't own the software. So this is by Jason Colbert. The office recommendation against limiting an exemption to specific technology or devices. In one of the biggest wins for the right to repair movement yet, the U.S. Copyright Office suggested Thursday, uh, this article was published June 22nd, that the U.S. government should take action to make it legal to repair anything you own forever, even if it requires hacking into the product's software. Manufacturers, including John Deere, Ford, various printer companies, and a host of consumer electronic companies have argued that it should be illegal to bypass the software locks that they put into their products, claiming that such circumvention violated copyright law. That means for the last several years, consumer rights groups have had to repeatedly engage in an exemption process with the Section 1201 of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Essentially, the Library of Congress decides which circumventions of copyright should be lawful, for example, unlocking your cell phone or hacking your tractor to be able to repair the transmission. But these exemptions expire every three years and require going through a protracted legal process to earn. Additionally, a separate exemption is required for each product category, and right now it's legal to hack software to repair a car, but not to repair a video game console. It's really audacious that no one is under the impression that John Q. Public can walk it in and do the exemption process. Um, Meredith Rose, a staff attorney at the Public Knowledge who works on exemptions, told me, you have to have the you have to purpose the language to the exemption and there's a comment period and the procedure changes every round as well thursday the u.s copyright office said that it's t- tired of having to deal with the same issue every three years and should be legal to repair the things you buy everything you buy forever the growing demand and relief under the section 1201 has coincided with the general understanding that the bona fide repair and maintenance activities are typically non-infringing the report stated repair activities are often protected from infringement claims by multiple copyright law provisions the office recommends against limiting an exemption to specific technologies or devices such as motor vehicles as any station as any statutory language will likely be soon outpaced by technology continue the office said it has received a huge increase in the number of public comments we received about repair in the last several 
several years, which reflects an increasing use of access control on a wide range of consumer devices containing copyrighted software. Uh, Gay Gord Gordon Ryan, executive director of Repair.org, a group pushing for state-level law so it would make it easier for you to repair your things, told me in an email that the office reports validates what her group has been pushing for and rebukes companies that have been trying to monopolize repair. We're, go we're getting a lot of legal support. Literally none of these rulings have gone in favor of the OEM, she said. The Supreme Court upheld the basic right of used equipment owners in the ink cartridge refill case. Uh, we're going to do an episode about that. And GE just lost an antitrust case for monopolizing repair of anesthetic machines in Texas. This latest study further supports our case that, that repair and maintenance is being unfairly monopolized through the abuse of copyright law. It's hugely encouraging to see the repair-friendly policy argument resonate and are being recommended to Congress, she added. The report also suggests that copyright law was not written to allow manufacturers to force their customers to use only authorized repair services, which are usually owned by the manufacturers themselves. Virtually all agree that the Section 1201 was not intended to facilitate manufacturer use of software locks to facilitate product tying, tying or to achieve a lock-in effort under which consumers are effectively limited to repair services offered by the manufacturer, it said. Unfortunately, the report are only recommendations to Congress, which would have to pass a law in order to enshrine them. On the bright side, Rose said that the report itself should make earning exemptions for repair much easier in the future. We can just cite their own report and say, you thought this should be a permanent exemption, so clearly there, there is a need, she said. It looks like there are fewer hurdles to jump through. There are a couple of bills currently in the ether that would codify these exemptions, and maybe with the report we can get the nudge needed to actually make those happen. So I imagine sometime, probably most likely in the fall, there will be some bill put forth in Congress. There's definitely bills being put forth in various states. And I think if you, I think if you hit enough states, especially these key states where the farmers are, you know, have the strongest lobbying arm, you're going to see some push. I imagine by definitely by 2018 that there will be a right to repair law passed. That's just my thoughts and feelings on the process. And that is our little update. So before we talk about net neutrality, uh, the protests uh, to save the internet and the, the different companies participating, but the, the method they're, they're going to use, I want to just give a little bit of the history of this type of protest. Uh, we talked about SOPA, which is the most recent one that occurred in um, the 2011-2012 uh, period. But the whole protesting on the internet and slowing things down or shutting things down has always been part of since the existence of the internet. Uh, many of the different types of protests had it centered around uh, nuclear disarmament. There's all sorts of different, you know, protests against different um, governments, primarily in the United States, but not exclusively, and various companies associated with the, the government doing things like, uh, if you're unfamiliar with faxes, if you happen to be... Uh, a younger member of the audience. Faxes used to be a method of communication where you took a piece of paper, you inputted a machine that's very much similar to the setup of your printer. So think of the where you place a, um, your printer paper, and then it would feed in. Uh, you would have the written piece of paper. It would feed in. It would uh, memorize the words on the paper, and then transmit it over the phone lines uh, to a receiving in another corresponding fa uh, fax, you would dial it in, and then that uh, document would print out, and it would duplicate that piece of information. And one of the methods that was utilized by early protesters was uh, basically spamming all these fax machines to run out the ink, and little cheeky techniques like this. But what I want to talk about was the blackout worldwide web protests, and this is where you kind of get the the concept of blacking out the internet. Really, uh, this is kind of like the genesis of, the, of that term or the, the beginning of that this kind of methodology. So, turn the web black protests are also called the Great Web Blackout, the Turn Your Web Pages Blackout protest, and Black Thursday. Uh, this is coming from Wikipedia. Was a uh, February eighth through the ninth, nineteen ninety six online activism in action led by. Motors Telecommunication Watch and the Center for Democracy and Technology, paralleling the long-term Blue Ribbon online free speech campaign organized by, once again, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, it protested the Communication Decency Act, or CDA, a piece of rider legislation for internet censorship attached to the Telecommunication Act of 1996 and was passed by the United States Congress on February 1, 1996. Time to co-sign with President Bill Clinton signing the bill on February 8, 1996. A large number of websites had their background color turned black for 48 hours to protest the CDA's curtailment of freedom expressions. 
Thousands of websites, including a number of major ones, joined in the protest. The campaign was noted by major media such as CNN, Time Magazine, and New York Times. So kind of a bit of background here. The legislation which gave rise to the protest threatened fines or imprisonments for those accused of distributing indecent or patently offensive materials without providing some way of blocking access to minors. Opponents of the bill compare this to demanding library, librarians uh, assessing the age of library users before allowing them access to particular books in the collection. The Communication Decency Act was struck down as unconstitutional by the United States Supreme Court in a 9-0 vote uh, the following year on June 26, 1997. Holding an earlier federal, upholding an earlier federal district court ruling. The majority of justices found the CDA violated adults' First Amendment free speech rights with an overbred, overboard suppression and vague language, despite any legitimate interest of the government in protecting children from harmful materials. A concurring minority opinion penned by Justice uh, Sarah Day O'Connor and G Chief Justice Ch William H. Rehnquist argued that the law might have been constitutionally if limited to situations concerning intent and knowledge to provide intent, indecent materials to children. So this type of activism has been around uh, the internet and protest in general for a very long time. Now, I don't want to, the current term, like saving the internet or blacking out the internet for for the Net Totality Day on July 12th, I don't want to be confused with a, a recent rise in the movement um, through the social media service called Blackout Day. Uh, Blackout Day is a social media event, and again, this is from Wicca, which encourages the posting of content that was created and features everyday black people. Specifically, tags, i.e., the Blackout or Blackout Day, are used to connect users to content and to increase visibility of the content. Blackout Day launched on March 6, 2015, and after an event on December 21, 2015, was held on the sixth day of every third month, starting March 6, 2016. Uh, the event, conceived in early February 2015 by Tumblr user Tavon Green, Green noticed that there was a lack of black representation on social media, specifically on Tumblr. Damn, I'm not seeing enough black people on my dash. Of course, I see a constant amount of black celebrities. What about the regular black people? Where is the shine? In addition, he noticed that when black people are depicted in the usually in the negative light, research has shown that black images in media adversely affect how members of the black community view themselves. These harmful images are not only seen by the black community, but by everyone who has access to the media outlet. Although images of black people have increased in mass media, those images have been distortionally um, harmful to the, the violent and crime-related content. Uh, examples of this is when um, any type of event, for example, of criminal activity, you often will see um, the mugshot of a black person. But if a white person commits the same similar crime, you see like a Facebook photo and not just very... Um, their mugshot. Um, I would say within the last year, because this has also always been a constant criticism within the black community, but it has increasingly been the case, particularly with the Black Lives Matter, rise of the Black Lives, Mo Lives Matter movement, of asking media outlets to stop doing that, particularly when it comes to um, individuals that were uh, shot by police to show their Facebook pictures, to get their pictures from their families and not show uh, any mugshot uh, pictures or source the Facebook images that show a more criminal light if they're like uh, smoking or uh, typically the same negative images and stuff like that. So that's just kind of giving you kind of an example. Generally, if black people are not being depicted as criminals, they're represented as entertainers such as athletes or musicians. Having these two polar, polar identities of lawless individuals and highly adored stars leaves a spectrum of people in the black community unrepresented. While associating blacks with athleticism is not harmful in itself, it's becoming harmful when that is the one of the only things blacks are associated with. This reality led to an ethical need for a positive and relatable images of the black community on platforms like social media. Concerned about these images, Green decided to gain feedback on his idea by going on Tumblr and through the, intent, the interactions that he met with Marissa Sebastian, who came up with the name behind the movement and later on became the PR and CEO of the movement. And Tumblr user V. Matthew King Yardy, known as uh, New Crook on social media, the creator behind the various logos of the event. Blackout Date was created as a 24-hour event that would expose the online black community and others on social media to positive images of everyday beautiful black individuals through selfies, videos, gifts, and other media. His goal was simple, shed a positive light on black individuals and cripple stereotypes. Uh, the idea spread quickly uh, once given a name and gained supporters within the black Tumblr community. 
An official website was created to help the online black community access up, up to date information on when and how it would work. Before the event, the creators posted guidelines on who could participate and how to do so. After the event launched, the creators decided to make it a monthly event on every first Friday of every month. But the frequency was an issue for the majority of supporters who believed that the event would not have a significant impact if it was too frequent. And they found as though it should be a yearly event on the day it was first launched, which was an issue for the creators and also for other supporters who thought the frequency should be increased. They changed it as a seasonal theme event that would occur on the 21st of September and December until January 2016, where it would be changed to fall on the 6th of every third month. Each blackout date would be themed about a black heritage slash history, and participants are encouraged to post content surrounding the given theme. Uh, the guidelines of black blackout are follows. If you identify as black either from Africa or from within the African diaspora, diaspora, mixed or part black, you can post a picture of yourself for others to admire, reblog, retweet, and repost. Uh, you'll tag or mention blackout day or blackout for, for it to count. You scroll through the tag and reblog, retweet, and repost other photos within your tag to help support. If you're not black slash non-black or white, you're just reblogging what is in the tag to show you support. Look for people with low notes to show them as some love as well. Official ha hashtags are, are used are hashtag blackout and blackout date. A reception. According to the Twitter analytics service Topsy, the hashtag blackout date was one of the top trending hashtags on Twitter in the United States with over 58,000 tweets by noon. And the trending topic on Facebook. The creators receive national attention for the creative digital activism and use this attention as a leverage to start a dialogue about race and the portrayal of black people in the media in and out of social media. Outside of social media, they seek to help the, keep the doc dialogues open through partnerships and have collaborated with uh, Book Riot and extended the partnership be, by sponsoring 22 black avid readers and writers. However, the event did not go without opposition hashtags such as White Out were created as a public objection against the movement. The principle is the same as Blackout, but features selfies of white people. The creators address this issue politely by reiterating the movement's goal. Other minority groups have tried unsuccessfully to mimic the movement by creating variations that are similar to the original Blackout, IG, Yellow Out Today, Brown Out Day, etc. The creators suggested that they be more original and create their tags that were more distinguishable from theirs. So there'll be a link in the show notes and things of that nature. It's still ongoing um, and things of that nature, but this is the tradition of taking activism and uh, using social media outlets and using uh, websites like Twitter, Tumblr, things of that nature, and bringing awareness in um, of a subject matter is done in different ways. And this is one of the, another type of methodology, if you will. So Battle for the Net and Fight for the Future are two of the biggest organizations, along with Electronic Frontier Foundation and... Who else? Participants. I have a link in the show notes where you can find all their information and then center all the various uh, consumer board, Digital Ocean, Digital West, Elastic, of course, Electronic Freedom Foundation, Opera, Open Source Initiative, Dropbox, ETH News, Frack, uh, Funny or Die. Um, there's just a wide range of different media outlets that are participating in this. Uh, Google, Facebook are participating, Netflix. Um, another big company is Pornhub. Pornhub has always been really, honestly, kind of the forefront of a lot of different political movements, typically dealing with uh, sexuality, but they also get dipped their toe in the political sphere. They hosted a movie of a Russian dissident um, for free on their service because it was banned in Russia, and they, they do things and actions like this, and it's very important in um, Engaging because they also have a very um, large audience. Um, they believe in internet freedom. Uh, again, porn of all the different types of businesses out there is always attacked and marginalized. If you th think about it, you know, uh, you just go through just the history of legal documentation when it regards to pornography it is one of the first things that's always constantly challenged and has to defend itself under the First Amendment rights and all the other different amendments, but making sure that all the different laws that come into existence are applicable to them, you know, getting business licenses, being able to pay taxes, having banks, things of that nature, and having those protections and making sure that they, that they have the same rights as everyone else. And they're participating in DuckDuckGo, Namecheap, OkCupid, you know, just it's a plethora of different companies addressing the need for net neutrality, and they're participating in a way to demonstrate by uh, having this little logo popping up that says, you know, contact your congressperson, and having a little um, 
you know, the standard little circle that says, you know, the upload, you know, things are loading, 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 loading circle, um, that you can add to your website if you choose to, uh, in your way of participating to, to demonstrate that this is what will happen if net neutrality exists. And please contact your congressperson, uh, sign these petitions, g- gain more information, find out more about how you can prevent, um, the repeal of net neutrality. So I'm going to read a few articles from Arisa, uh, Arsa Technica and a couple of Reddit posts and kind of wrap things up. I just wanted to just kind of highlight, you know, what people are doing. So I'm going to start with The Verge here. So Tumblr was big with SOPA. Tumblr was a, just like it was for um, Blackout Day, was a center for uh, that particular movement as a means of getting awareness about that. Tumblr was also a source for SOPA um, back in 2011, but then it got bought and things have changed. So here we go. Verizon is killing Tumblr's fight for net neutrality. One of the open internet's fiercest defenders has a new boss by Catalina Tiffany. And this goes back to what we were discussing about maybe we need to start breaking these companies up. The Verge. In 2014, Tumblr was on the front lines of the battle of net neutrality. The company stood alongside Amazon, Kickstarter, SD, Vimo, Reddit, and Netflix during the battle for the net days of action. Tumblr CEO David Karp was also part of the group of New York tech CEOs that met with FCC Chairman Tom Wheeler in Brooklyn that summer while the FCC fielded public comments on the new Title II rules. President Obama invited Karp to the White House to discuss various issues around the political about around the public education and in february 2015 the wall street journal reported that it was the influence of carp and a small group of liberal tech ceos that swayed obama towards the philosophy of internet as a public utility but three years later as the battle for the net neutrality he's up once again tumblr has been uncharacteristically silent the last mention of net neutrality in tumblr's staff blog which frequently posts about political issues from civil rights to climate change to gun control to student loan debt was in june 2016 and Tumblr is not listed as a participant tech company for the Battle of Net's next day of action coming up um, in three weeks. This is published in June. A representative of the Battle for the Net told The Verge in an email, Outreach for the Day of Action is very much an active and ongoing process. I wouldn't read too much into it, who is and who isn't on the list so far. Still, a rep of Tumblr declined on comment on whether the company would participate. An AOL senior VP of brand communication, Caroline Campbell, responded to an inquiry whether Tumblr would maintain its stance on net neutrality writing. It's just too early to answer your question. When a company and CEO have a reputation of being loud, silence says something. Carp is still outspoken on other issues that matter to him. However, he's on the board of Planned Parenthood, and Tumblr hosted a Never Going Back rally in the at, um South by Southwest this year, protesting renewed threats on reproductive rights. He published a joint statement with Planned Parenthood President Cecilia Richards on The Verge and is extremely outspoken about his belief that tech industry leaders are obligated to step in on defending federal funding for Planned Parenthood. Meanwhile, CARP's only public comment about net neutrality since 2016's election was a quote he gave to Variety as an aside at South by Southwest in March. I'm heartbroken to see the sea change on net neutrality. One reason for CARP and Tumblr silence, last week Verizon completed its acquisition of Tumblr's parent company, Yahoo, kicking off this constant merger of Yahoo and AOL to create a new company called Oath. And as one of the world's largest ISPs, Verizon is notorious for challenging the principles of net neutrality. It sued the FCC in an effort to overturn net neutrality rules in 2011, and its general counsel, Kathy Grillo, published a note this April um, complimenting the new FCC's chairman, Ajit's Pi's plan to weaken telecommunication regulations. So they're a bit of a box here. Uh, now multiple sources tell the version employees are concerned that CARP has been scourged from speaking publicly on the issue. And one engineer conveyed that CARP told a group of engineers and engineering directors as much in weekly meeting that took place shortly after South by Southwest. South by Southwest. CARP has talked about the net neutrality stuff internally, but won't comment to support it externally anymore, the engineer said. He assured us that he is going to keep trying to fight for the ability to fight for it publicly. CARP did not respond to our four emails asking for comment, and neither Yahoo nor Tumblr will speak about the matter on the record. On the day Verizon's Yahoo acquisition was completed, Tumblr was hit by a wave of layoffs. A number of current and former employees shared a post by social media uh, industry commentator Andrea Lopez entitled Layoffs in the Tumblr of the Centipede. In it, Lopez theorized, in addition to the real-life talented human beings impacted by the layoffs, the move is a warning and reminder. Tumblr is no longer in the protective purgatory of pre-Verizon Yahoo. 
uh, if Mayor's Yahoo didn't really know what it was doing with Tumblr, that meant that Tumblr was free to do what it wanted. That extended to politics. Yahoo didn't give Tumblr any official blessings or encouragement when it decided to become the tech industry's fiercest net neutrality defender three years ago. Now things are a little bit stickier. Uh, Brian Isis, an engineer manager who worked at Tumblr from March 12th to November 2015, explained that Tumblr's closure to the version email writing, We all participated with many causes. IG, SOPA, slash PIPA, net neutrality was a huge part of the company's culture. A free and open internet was a prerequisite for Tumblr to grow from an idea in Davis' head into the platform that is today. And during my tenure there, Tumblr never shied away from speaking out about causes that the team collectively believe in. A former employee who eventually left Tumblr told The Verge that, that some employees wanted to work there because of its culture, community, and activism have been feeling uneasy for at least the last several weeks because what they feel is a shift in Tumblr's priorities. Some of the previous stances on issues that are really important to Tumblr employees and its community are being silenced to the former employee. We have been really noisy about things like net neutrality in the past, and we asked the new head, Simon Coffey, about it in All Hands a few weeks ago, and he said it was not his problem and above his pay grade. The current employee and another former employee corroborated his account. Uh, Simon Coloff is the former CEO of Flurry, an analytic app that was acquired by Yahoo in 2014. And under Yahoo, Coloff was given a myriad of responsibilities related mostly to mobile app development and publishing partners, including Yahoo News, Yahoo Sports, and Tumblr. He was, pro he was promoted to senior VP in April 2015 and then tapped by Oath CEO Tim Armstrong to head media brands and products, and CARP now reports directly to Coughlin. And then it just kind of goes on and a little bit about the culture and stuff like that. Uh, I just kind of want to read the conclusion here uh, about the change from Verizon into Tumblr. There has been a notable exodus of many individuals who spearhead Tumblr's net neutrality activism. These include employees like former public policy lead Leba Rubston, now at 21st Century Fox, and General Counsel uh, Ari Shahid, now at BuzzFeed, who collaborated on Tumblr's first major actions in support of net neutrality. Catherine Braun, head of communication on Tumblr since March 11th, left the company this month, writing that her biggest accomplishment during that time included saving net neutrality for a minute there. It is not an overstatement. Tumblr even went to court to defend net neutrality in 2015 along the other, alongside other NYC startups and had built an alliance with the year before. And the tech policy lawyer Marvin Army told Motherboard at the time, no company deserves more credit than the New York tech community for the victory of the FCC. It's important to note that 2017 and 2014 battles for the net neutrality are very different, even when completely divorced from Verizon's involvement at Tumblr. Defenders of the open internet are facing a more antagonistic FCC in Congress, as well as a president who does not seem to know what net neutrality is and is far more likely to ignore the issue completely than invite David Karp back to the White House. Whether or not Karp comes out and supporting net neutrality, all the employees who spoke with we're still adamant about fighting for causes. We all love Tumblr and actually really care about the future and community, so one former employee. And many of the people who are still there are good people trying to do the right thing. So this is, again, it's just these acquisitions that these ISPs are doing. Uh, you could already see this the cultural change and shift, uh, the silencing, that you, if you will, um, so they can get what they want, which is all right. They own the property, things of that nature. But again, it, it speaks to what I was speaking about beforehand with that, uh, in the last episode, that we might have to make a decision on whether or not these ISPs, are they content creators or are they ISPs? Maybe they cannot be both. And they might be, has to have a situation like the movie industry where they have to, um, and even television, they have to distribute the content, but they can't own everything. They can't, I think it's called vertical, I have to look it up, vertical, vertical integration where they own everything top and down, down. Like even with the, the car companies, the car companies, don't actually own the dealerships. Uh, the law is to such the point where you have to go to a dealership. Now, Tesla in, in itself is changing that with uh, Tesla storefronts, but there's there was a reason for that in a sense. And while Tesla is just one company, all these ISPs are, um, you know, there's just four of them right now, really, in this country. And it, there might be a need where we have to really s rethink about this in our battle uh, with keeping an open free internet about how we deal with these companies and what it takes to really truly win the battle for the open and free internet. So this is from Ars Tech, uh, Amazon and Reddit try to save net neutrality rules in a day of action. Um, activists and websites plan an internet way wide day of action on July 12th. So this is big. Reddit was there last time around, but Amazon wasn't. So Amazon, Reddit, Mozilla, Mozilla and other internet companies are joining net neutrality activists 
uh, next month on an internet-wide day action to say net neutrality. Um, the FCC wants to destroy net neutrality and give big cable companies control of what we see at, and do online. Activist group fight for the future, free press, and demand progress in an announcement today. Um, I'll, that was the other site I was looking for. Um, I'll have a link in the show notes as well to free press uh, so you can look at their site as well. Those are the three major organizations really spearheading it, along with Electronic Frontier Foundation, but they're like more of a supporting player to these three and demand progress. Uh, so if they get... What, their way, they'll allow widespread throttling, blocking, and censorship, and extra fees. And on July 12th, the internet will come together to stop. We kind of know this, so let's, Netflix says it's time for others to take the lead. Uh, the participation of Amazon, one of the biggest tech giants and major rival to Netflix in the online video market, is notable given Netflix's decision to pull back the net neutrality debate. Uh, we talked about that a little bit about last um, episode. Online video providers are among the biggest beneficiaries in the net neutrality rules as internet providers might otherwise try to restrict access to video services that compete against their cable tap TV packages. Uh, Netflix, the most popular video streaming service in the U.S., was one of the most prominent voices supporting net neutrality rules before the FCC imposed the current regulations in February 2015. Got to cover this a little bit, try to get skipped down to the Amazon part. Amazon wasn't heavily involved in the public debate as Netflix before the current rules was imposed, but both companies signed a letter to the FCC commissioners in 2014, urging them to impose strict net neutrality rules. While startups may have a special vulnerability to repeal the net neutrality rules, the memo list of July 12th Day of Action shows that some bigger internet companies still think it's important to stay involved in the public debate. So they're stepping up, and that has to really probably do with the fact that they have Amazon Prime Video, uh... Jeff Bozzo and Amazon, they're trying to do all these different things, and they're seeking to, you know, be a player in in the marketplace, particularly in um, video and movies and uh, original movie programming, original movies and TV shows. And globally, they, just like Netflix, they're reaching, trying to reach a global market and having um, global programming as well. And considering Amazon is a very large global company already and already has customers um, probably a larger customer base than than Netflix having that video streaming service, and I believe they have they're going to offshoot it, or if they're not already offshoot it, I know it's bundled into Prime already, offshoot it where they they can they will have customers that will be able to just sign up to their uh, Amazon Video. It's going to be a very important for them um, as a company to have you know not have that tiered system. Now I do want to add that. Um, Tumblr has joined, but it's it's not as vocal as it was last time. Um, they're supposed to participate in some type of fashion for Net Neutrality Day. Um, I don't know how the extent it is going to be, considering that it's just it wasn't like the last time during SOPA and PIPA, and the last time the Net Neutrality um, came about. So I just want to read this. Um, it's a, it's a twenty day old post, but I just want to read because it's. Um, a part of this post, it kind of, again, it kind of just reemphasizes the contents and it's, it shows how many, um, at the point that this post was made, of the different types of businesses that are participating in net neutrality. It comes from our uh, technology subreddit, and the post states that net neutrality day of action update. You know, Twitter, SoundCloud, and Medium have joined Reddit. This could be as big as SOPA. So, hey, Reddit, I just wanted to give another quick update on the internet-wide day of action to save net neutrality planned by or July 12th that tons of major websites, subreddits, and online communities that internet users have helped being organized. Uh, the momentum is continuing to build in the past few days. Twitter, SoundCloud, Medium, Adblock, Twilla, and some other big names have joined. Since we announced earlier this month, a ton of other high-traffic sites have signed up, including Amazon, Namecheap, okay, we already named them, OkCupid, okay, uh, GitHub, Vimo, Y Combinator, and Private Internet Access. Uh, Reddit itself has joined along with more than 80 subreddits. Uh, I think that number is up to 100 as of the recording of this episode, which was July 10th. We started solidifying ideas for types of messages that sites can display on the day of the protest, and you can check these out here. You can also, uh, I believe there's a, a, a CCS thing that you can uh, change your subreddit uh, if you happen to be a moderator. 
important contest for previous updates below. Net neutrality is a basic principle that prevents internet service providers like Comcast and Verizon from charging us extra fees to access the online content we want, or throttling, blocking, and censoring websites and apps. Title II is a legal framework for net neutrality, and the FCC is trying to get rid of it under the immense pressure of the cable lobby. This day of action is an incredibly important moment for the internet to come together across political lines and show that we don't want our cable companies controlling what we can do online or picking winners and losers when it comes to streaming services, games, and online content. The current FCC chairman, Ajit Pai, is a former Verizon lawyer and seems on tent and getting rid of the net neutrality and misleading the public about it. But the FCC has to answer to Congress, and we can create another moment of massive online protests like the SOPA blackout and the internet slowdown. We have a real chance of stopping the FCC in its tracks and protecting the internet as a free and open platform for creative innovation and exchanges of ideas. So if you got a website, blog, Tumblr, or any kind of social media following, or if you're a subreddit mod or active in an online community or forum, please get involved. There's so much we can do do as Redditors can do, from blacking out our sites to drive to drive emails and phone calls to organize in-person meetings with our lawyers. Feel free to message me directly as a, a, a email team at uh, fightthefuture.org or get involved and learn more here. So people are organizing through Reddit, all the different sites I've linked on the show notes um, for people to participate, to share, to uh, contribute, to engage, and to get active. And mostly, you know, call your congressperson, fax your congressperson, and keep at it. it just, it's not just a 12. You have to keep on going because the comment period is all the way to August 16th. And at that point, they're going to start making some decisions. And so it's important to get these comments out there to get engaging so that um, Congress is very much aware of the position that um, not only the American people, but the world feels about this change to the rule. So this is the last article I'm going to read on this matter. Um, Net Neutrality Rules, How Open Internet Rules Are Actually Helping Consumers by Rob Figaro. Opponents of the open internet regulation have long argued that such rules will lead to slower broadband internet speeds. The reason is that with more regulation in place, internet providers won't want to risk their investment in the infrastructure needed to improve the networks, which would hurt consumers. And yet, five months after former Federal Communication Commission Chairman Tom Wheeler challenged those claims by asking opponents where's the fire, the broadband business has yet to implode. In fact, it may actually improve for customers. Data from internet providers themselves show that these firms have moved to offer people faster connections and better choices. Maybe you can't credit the Oprah internet rules for that, but it's certainly becoming harder to blame them for an industry-wide slowdown. Net neutrality doesn't seem to hurt ISPs. Until recently, much of the debate over open internet or net neutrality rules that ban internet providers from blocking, slowing, or selling proprietary priority delivery speeds to legal sites have focused on whether these regulations have led to broadband providers to put less money into expanding their networks. In a January speech that marked his last public talk at FCC chair, Wheeler had pointed to a slight rise in the broadband investment over his term from $75 billion in 2013 to $76 billion in 2015. But the trade group that compiled those numbers the U.S. Telecom spun them in its own press release as evidence of net neutrality and pairing investment. That's because the 2015 figure fell below the 2014's $77 billion in spending. The group has since predicted that the broadband investment will further decline in 2016. Meanwhile, Wheeler and other net neutrality activists said lower network upgrade costs brought on by increased efficiency means that the $2016 buys more broadband than the $2013, something an AT&T executive bragged about to investors in 2016. And pro net neutrality groups like Free Press and the Internet Association have further argued that numbers showing lower investments include cherry picking the original data. Fortunately, we now have another metric to check Internet providers' own reports to the FCC and their networks. Posted in April, those reports show impressive growth. From the end of 2015 to the middle of 2016, the share of census tracts, subsets of cities and counties with at most several thousand people each, with at least two broadband services offering downloads of 25 megabytes per second, rose from 24% to 42%. The most recent study estimates that those numbers translate to 61.4 million households with high-speed competition and 53% of Americans are 117 million households. And in this debate, at least connecting more people with faster services should matter more than the budgets involved. Net neutrality advocates should acknowledge the progress, too. During the June 26, a town hall in Arlington, Virginia, Wheeler dragged out the now obsolete line that three-quarters of the broadband users have no choice. During the meeting, the meeting uh, Wheeler explained the risk of undoing open internet rulers, rules could hurt smaller startup companies, saying if those individuals don't have access to you, the consumer, it's game, set, match. But would internet f- providers actually cut off legal sites from their customers? 
U.S. firms have not had not any time recently. So Wheeler's words of fire question can also be fairly asked for net brutality advocates who raise the specter of size gating blacklisted by broadband providers. The past few years have shown that, that what can happen when internet providers allow a site's connection to become logged down. Exhibit A, Netflix became mysteriously unviewable around 2012 on some theoretical fast enough providers, thanks to interconnection arrangements that left inefficient capacity into residential networks of firms like Comcast and Verizon, Yahoo Finance corporate parent. Wheeler noted the current regulation allows the FTC to stop that kind of mischief, he warned. If those rules don't exist, it's a whole new game. Opponents of the current op- open net inter- internet rules, led by Wheeler's accuser, Ajit Pai, prefer to ra- phrase things differently. Do they say we let internet providers offer paid prioritization deals that, they, that ensure a site's fees never buffer or stutter? Those providers can use the proceeds to expand their networks. But proof seems scarce. An event last week in Washington hosted by the New York's Open Technology Institute and the Internet Association, I asked FEMA's general counsel, Michael Chia, if any provider anywhere in the world had offered the video site the paid prioritization deal. He said none had. High Tech Forum founder Richard Bennett, a longtime opponent of the net tally rules, also couldn't name any paid priority arrangements sold by residential providers. The closer he came, the upgrade connection deal Comcast followed by a few other giant SPs worked out with Netflix in 2013. Comcast, however, has plenty of cash for network upgrades and is kept right on spinning through the advent and net neutrality rules. Would a small provider have the same leverage? The history of cable TV suggests not. Public Knowledge Vice President Harold Fields said that smaller cable operators routinely pay more than their larger counterparts when no- negotiating carriage deals with channels. So if smaller ISPs even get a Netflix or a YouTube channel to take his call, the weak clout will leave them making little money off of any deals. The least convincing argument of all. To avoid getting to the weeds of the business model discussion and network expansion um, arithmetic, opponents of net neutrality rules often fall back onto the one sentence critique of net neutrality rules. They represent government regulating the internet. Well, if there are rules on how internet providers treat their customers regulate the internet, then the Food and Drug Administration food safety rules regulate their stomach and FCC bans on air obscenities regulate your ears and eyes. I know many people aren't too fond of government regulation in general, but do net brutality opponents really want to bet that they aren't outnumbered by those who complain even more about their cable or phone company? So this article is a bit mixed, and we'll just kind of break it down here. At this present time, you know, no, there hasn't been um, anyone being offered a, the payment plans or tiers, and it's simply because the green light it hasn't been signaled by the government that will allow for the cable companies to do something like that. But they do have plans in place. It's been discussed uh, through investors um, and companies and it's talked about. Uh, this is something that they want. To the whole regulation of the internet thing, I can understand it to the point with the Title II, but the internet in itself is already kind of sort of regulated by the way that the broadband companies exist in the first place. Um, wireless is regulated. All sorts of aspects of the internet in itself, particularly when it comes to connection, is regulated. So that's just kind of almost a moot point. Really what it, this is, is is one of those if if scenarios, if then scenarios. And do we want to really live in a world if the internet ISPs have the ability to prioritize um, web traffic and therefore are able to charge people or charge different companies more to be able to be have the top tier high grade connection then what will that do to the consumers are they going to have to pay what amount to be able to access you know the netflix and their amazons and their tumblers and their blogs or even the startup their company to be able to have the best app um look at pokemon go that i mean they have all these different servers globally around the world and they still consistently crash what would happen to a smaller app that might um, blow up, not to the extent that Pokemon Go did, but blow up to the extent to where not only are they having server issues, but now they're going to have connection issues because they're not paying the, the appropriate fee. What is that going to do to their business model? Um, there's all sorts of issues and problems when it comes to net neutrality. But the most important thing is this is just another means that the, uh, the government is using these cable companies, so these corporations, to prevent the open free internet. This open communication system is causing all this disruption in all these different industries, particularly when it comes to government, where the people are able to communicate, organize, and challenge all these different 
rules and oppositions and people don't like being challenged and most importantly they don't really like competition just look what happened to netflix and amazon and how they primarily netflix but how the streaming video has changed the game when it comes to television programming when it comes to distribution of movies really all it is is just it's a protectionist measure if you think about it a uh, repealing title to uh, it's a protection and protectionist issue of this particular industry, and it's not something that's the place of the government to protect the bottom line of these um, corporations, if you will. Uh, the free market is going to, if a true free market will allow the person with the best product, the best marketing, um, the best means of getting the word out, if you will, um, and the best customer service to win in the end. And they're just trying to, once again, through carny capitalism, trying to gain the system to their favor. Not to mention the really the global impact that it would have um, around the world, really. Um, if American companies don't have the, the same connection speeds or the same access speeds um, that other countries have because they don't have this type of rule, then they're going to fall behind when it comes to the global marketplace. So that's it just about the day. It's, you know, it's July 12th. Um, you can connect to these websites. It's, what it's going to do is you're going to have like this little pop-up screen that you can add to your to your site. You can do GIFs. You can do videos. You can do media. You can do blog posts. I'll, people are doing all sorts of different kind of things to get the word out, to let people know that when you, when you hit their site, um, the reason you're not going to be able to have the same access, the reason why you're seeing this and asking to you to uh, contact your congressperson is because of net neutrality, is because of the effort to um, repeal it, to undo Title 12, and how it is going to fundamentally change the Internet as we know it today. So, um, so that's pretty much all I have to say about this day and the companies participating in it. And a little bit about the history of how this is not the first time we talked about SOPA, which was the biggest, um, biggest type of movement when it came to this type of internet protest. Uh, we will do a, a follow up or update episode about you know what came out of the the protest, how it went, what it actually looked like, who was you know fully participating, what websites looked like, and just kind of go a rundown through that. I probably wait about a week for all the you know the information to come out but there you go the next thing i'm going to talk about is you know uh things that i'm using i don't have a build your own build your own, build your own for this episode but i do have a product that i am using uh since i'm on the uh a linux operating system uh Ubuntu, to be specific i i use a a digital ebook management called Calbarer. I'm going to read a little bit about it. A cover, cover powerful and easy to use ebook manager. User says it's standing and must have it. It allows you to do every, do nearly everything and it takes things to step beyond normal ebook software. It's also completely free and open source and great both for casual users and computer experts. It saves time on your ebook collection. It uses every, it's used everywhere with anything. It's comprehensive ebook viewer. It downloads uh, news, news and slash magazines from the web. It share and back up your library easily. It edits the books in your collections, and it satisfies every ebook needed and gets supported. So it has different um, ways you can save it from PDF to the different types of ebook management. It allows you to be able to convert it so you can put it on your Kindle or any other type of ebook devices that you may utilize. Uh, you can keep it on your desktop. You can port it to, like I said, your your ebook reader. Uh, it's a great management system. Is how I read a lot of the white papers that I download for in the cryptocurrency space, as well as other um, both free and publicly traded uh, ebooks, and as well as my books that I may obtain uh, through the Amazon system. I'm able to do a little finagling and import it into Cabrera. So it's a very effective, very efficient system. It allows for me to be able to uh, easily read the books on my desktop on my Ubuntu and when I want to or choose to I can either port it to uh, my Kindle um, when I want to read a particular uh, ebook so there's that so if you're on Linux uh, you can download a cover ebook on, onto your system it is you can download it from your site or depending on which um, Linux system you have you might have a means of being able to pull it from at least i know um with ubuntu they have like a little app system like they do for mobile devices where you can download um already kind of approved uh software programs and cabrera is in one of them is one of them so on to our manifesto so the digital manifesto of the episode it is called the twitter ethics manifesto you don't need to speak for us we are talking by dorothy kim and his song 
Kim on April 7, 2014. We entered Twitter because we believe as a medium that's not hostile to women of color writers, thinkers, and conversations. But perhaps we should reconsider. Perhaps each time we log in, we should reread Twitter's privacy agreement, their legal binding contract. Perhaps we should remind each other and ourselves that Twitter is a closed private corporation with corporate dreams and nightmares. Perhaps we should remind each other that Twitter's model is the antithesis of open access, creative commons, feminist, Marxist, queer, take your pick. Perhaps we should remind each other that such financial and structural impediments should motivate us to converse elsewhere, to build our own platform, or to inhabit a platform that functions beyond mere profit. But most of us enter because it's designed, it's designated, mediated public space. Then uh, Boyd writes that social network sites are the largest generation of mediated, mediated public public's environments where people can gather publicly through mediating technology. In some sense, mediated Publics are similar to the unmediated publics with what with which most people are familiar: parks, malls, parking lots, cafes, etc. A French cafe scene with many tables close together, with different parties packed into the sidewalk seating area. Pre-existing social networks are spaces we go to for public conversation. The dream of building our own structures complements the decolonization of the public space that we are invested in. Lately, the hostility of Twitter has become even more apparent. The emotional and intellectual labor of women of color is being casually appropriated slash borrowed to benefit and support the narratives of established journalists writing for larger platforms. The work in organizations of uh, women of color on Twitter has been taken by journalists and turned into mainstream stories, news articles, butt feed list- listicles, and more, without the writers or activists being asked, credited, cited, or paid. As Tina Vac- Vasquez has insightfully reported in What's Missing from Journalists' Tactic of Snagging Stories from Twitter? Respect. This is compounded by because so many of the journalists who write about Twitter are male and slash or white. In fact, Vasquez points out that when discussing the sensitive topic of what women wore when they were raped, a discussion was meant to counter the idea that women asked for it, but what they wore. The only person to respectfully cover this was the Roots' Janae Desmond Harris. Vasquez identifies as a Latina and Desmond Harris as an African-American female journalist. Considering the pop the papacy of minority and slash or women writers in mainstream newsrooms, it should not shock that race and gender affects the quality reporting. Other mainstream news sources like Buffy's just, just quote unquote unquote fucked everything up. Mainstream media perpetrates a litany of such moments. With this co-op, uh, co-opetition and abuse contested, liberal Democrats like Hamilton Nolan tell us to chill out. In his article, Twitter is Public, Nolan pat- patronized Women of color feminists have taken up debates around Twitter's harvesting. Only he understands the definition of public and how Twitter functions. He assumes um, patriotic duties. It explains to us that the world is unfair and that we must reread our contract with Twitter. If you want to stay in public sphere, shut up, he says with a bevelant nonchalance. You can leave and go elsewhere, he repeats, rolling his eyes. Gosh, we're, we're so silly and stuff. Thanks, Hammy. How could we forget that quote-unquote public means free w- women of color labor, the uplifting of corporate profiteering? That quote unquote public means exploited, exploitation is fair game. Those with bigger tools need to widely appropriate the language of others for their own private and personal gains. Public means white property laws. Public means not safe for women of color. Public means not safe for marginalized voices. Public means that we must be grateful to exist in their sphere. Disrup- distributing Freudian hi- hierarchies of profit. Kathleen Fitzpatrick's planned obsolescence, published a, as a print book by the NY Press in 2011, and through open access peer review in 2009, Media Common Press opens up the question of knowledge formation, credit, and idea access. Though she's primarily thinking about the academic publishing enterprise and how academic knowledge is owned, reviewed, and disseminated like a Ford factory assembly line, her points also fit in thinking about the non-academic digital labor and digital writing. She writes that digital networks as structures that facilitate interaction, communication, and interconnection require us to think of differently about what it is we're going to, what we're doing as we write. As the example of the blog might suggest, communities best engage with one another around writing that is open rather than closed, in process rather than concluded. There has been a push and pull in academic communications about the different systems of knowledge, formation, and dissemination. Academic presses, like many of our contemporary media companies, cling to the old Freudian models of knowledge, ownership, production, and dissemination. Own, reviewed, and dissemination is also a perfect way to describe the Twitter to BuzzFeed to mainstream media model. Tweets are appropriated by BuzzFeed journalists for their smart snark articles, The mainstream media platforms come to further monetize BuzzFeed's scavenger hunts. Their cycle repeats. Fitzpatrick Works explains and advocates for a different feature, the planned obsolescence of the Freudian model 
in academic knowledge production. For a future that will involve collaborative production, distributed access, and constant revision and reformation of knowledge. In other words, the end of fixed sellable products, i.e. a book that has ended. And instead of managing, imagining of knowledge environments, communication, and feedback loops, where knowledge is constantly rethought, revised, and reinvented. Twitter was imagined as a micro-blogging platform. In other words, the founders of Twitter have described their goals as focus, focusing on the user experience, quote-unquote, organized around a, quote-unquote, serendipity. However, more recently, it has been remarked by Dan Faber that, quote-unquote, Twitter is basically a mass-scale marketing platform in which every tweeter is a marketer and every follower is a set of eyeballs and potential remarketer. However, the driving forces have been about, uh, quote, interaction, communication, and interconnection, end quote, amongst its users. Thus, an open system as a platform has recently shown how collaborative engagement, learning, and conversation is pulsed as a dynamic process that has produced hashtag conversation, political action, and women of color vocalization. We're thinking about hashtag solidarities for white women started by Mika Knell, uh, hashtag economic violence uh, originated by Andy Smith and at uh, Prison Culture, uh, hashtag change the name, hashtag not your mascot by Danny at uh, Zaldani IX3, Jacqueline Keller and other native feminists, uh, feminists and hashtag change that name, hashtag not your ma- mascot. Oh, I already wrote that. Um, and uh, hashtag not your Asian psychic by Susie Park. Park. The conversation generated by these hashtags and their users have vibrated throughout the web and are still ongoing. While Twitter can be innovative and surprising as an activist tool, conditions have emerged from Twitter the medium, Twitter the corporation, Twitter the public. Particularly as Susie Park and David Leonard have discussed in Defense of Twitter Feminism, we have noticed that a growing trend of, of unabashedly harvesting a women of color intellectual labor for both journalistic and academic study. Trudy um, Gradient Lair has written prolifically about the pleasures in her site and her intellectual labor have witnessed in her post. I cannot be any more tired of academia and not even a part of it, she writes. I have not gotten any better at dealing with a demand that should be flattered by people whose choices to exploit me over anyone else they could have chosen. Uh, end quote. Journalists, academics, and mainstream media platforms that quote out of contents, quote without permission, are plagiarized, they're not performing acts of kindness, they're abusing their powers as gatekeepers. They're positioning themselves as the managers of relevant information and disregarding the informational systems and dialogues that are organically taking place. In order to reject the normalization of this kind of exploitation, we must rethink the continuation of this Freudian model of knowledge, protection where the quote unquote owner slash author, who is often not the original content creator, gets the credit for the quote-unquote, product being sold on the marketplace. These are old and conservative approaches to business and knowledge creation, yet these two different models, um, Ford versus plan obsolescence, appear to constantly butt heads. Even in smarter business circles, the older Fordian model has been superseded, yet corporations like Twitter seem unable to absorb the shift completely in their business model. Twitter, the corporation, runs on the Ford, Ford factory logic. Twitter, the tool, can be revolutionary. The triple bottom line in the circular economy, the economist neatly explains that a dis- dis- disruption in the fro- the economist neatly explains a disruption in the Freudian logics of production, assembly, sale, and consumption, and of course the added points of waste. You must complicit the you must complicate the linear product and dream of assembly line model. For example, the idea of the quote unquote triple bottom line was first coined by John Eglinton twenty years ago. The idea argues that companies quote unquote, should be preparing three different bottom lines. Profit, dash the more traditional idea of a corporate profit model. People, dash how socially responsible a company is to the stakeholders and workers. And planet, dash is environmental responsibility. In order to do business in the new economic world, a company should take the triple bottom line into account in order to think about the business model as an integrated peak, integrated process. All three lines, profit, people, planet, function in a system that interacts and works with each other. So the question is, how does Twitter think about their business modeling in relation to the disruptive platform? For Twitter, striving for the triple bottom line will create a business model fueled by process rather than a linear product. Such a model will privilege the generation of ideas, particularly radical rather than just capitalistic ideas, as its main objective. This privilege would ensure a circular movement with the company, the process of thinking that through monetary profits, social responsibility to people, and sustainability for the world should mean that Twitter should be functioning in a way that thinks about all three, all these three strand, strands entwined together. How does monetary profit intermix with social responsibility to people, both workers and users, entwined with our environmental sustainability? As uh, 
and Tony Kim, leading environmental architect and Schmidt MacArthur Fellow, argue sustainability is a process, not a product, quote unquote. One should in fact think about quote unquote sustainability or any of these terms, quote unquote social responsibility, or even quote unquote profit as a singular and productive driven solution. In other words, slapping solar panels on the Twitter office building does not make it more quote unquote sustainable. Rather, it's part of the many systemic things a corporation can do to achieve sustainability. Sustainability is quote unquote a moving target. Very much like quote unquote social responsibility to people and quote unquote monetary profits are moving targets. Profit people and planet. Profit people and planet are part of the ongoing process that must involve collaborative work and we must flatten hierarchies to achieve our constantly evolving systematic goals. If Twitter commits to these intertwining goals, they should continually be considered how the intellectual output and energy and labor of their users must be compensated and remain sustainable and ethical. As Liskin, Lisa Nakamura has written, invisible women of, uh, women of colors labor is behind the digital profits of companies like Apple. Likewise, Twitter's future profits are particularly lucrative to international business commerce compared to Facebook and other social media sites due to its broader and more diversified demographic of higher African-American and Latino users. Yet there is no distribution of his wealth down to the invisible women of color labor. Prophets, archives, and mythology. If there are your, if these are your records, where are your memories? The Twitter Corporation is a leader innovator of digital archiving. At any time, users can download their personal tweet history. The Library of Congress is sorting all of our public tweets, and Twitter's sophisticated search functions have streamlined internet sleuthing. Their archiving system is one of the most futuristic and elite programs in existence, and they are redefining how to archive the internet. They should concern us for very reasons, specifically because the archive system is like Twitter. It's closed, private, profit-driven, and top-down. The archive system follows an ancient model of providence slash collecting. Uh, the object belongs to the purchaser, the man with the papers. The private closed archive will have a significant importance in the future. It will be a constant source of data mining possibilities. And Twitter, the corporation, will have no incentive not to gatekeep according to its political, according to its politics and desires. Just like the Fortis model of production needing to be eradicated, there's no reason for Twitter, the corporation, to abide by ancient archival methods. We challenge Twitter to innovate beyond its sleek technology updates. We challenge it to innovate in its definition and methods. Scan a vintage photo of Henry Ford right in a Model T car, which is emblazoned 15 billion car. Alternatives to singular providence. Twitter doesn't have to look far. Post-colonial archivists have been coming up with innovative solutions to singular providence. There are several alternative possibilities. For example, just to list a few possibilities. 1. Parallel providence. This conceptualizes the necessity for stories slash process slash experience to be centered as authors by politicizing and and variegating the notion of origins. 2. co creatorship By deploying post-colonial and narrative, native studies mythologies, co creatorship wishes it to acknowledge both keeper of the record and the storyteller as authors. This is from uh, Chris Hurley and A. and J. Gillen. 3. Centering profits as ethnicity. Here, the object is located within its most useful center, the subject of the archive as the author, rather than the uh, conqueror slash managers or record keeper, uh, Joel Worrell. But maybe this is all too revolutionary for the Twitter, the Fortis factory. Archivist Chris Hurley writes, uh, quote, In cyberspace, the essence of record keeping will not lie in the management of digital objects, but in the narratives about formation, function, and process, end quote. To this effect, we would like to decenter the author and pro author product archive, profit linear progression, and reimagine a digital future in which the triple bottom line and plan obsolescence are the angle of Twitter's functionality. There would be flattened hierarchies of production, sharing, citation, and labor to create a different digital future. We have written a hashtag Twitter ethics manifesto. We want to reimagine the intersection and the mythologies to inspect of race, gender, labor, and digital future in both journalism and academia. The hashtag Twitter ethics manifesto. This is based on a collected open Twitter conversation asked to the community about hashtag Twitter ethics. What should the Twitter ethics be in journalism and academic research? What are the ethics for journalists and academic researchers on Twitter? What should journalists and academics do to respect all women of color, feminists? What do we need to do to make sure we are not exploiting intellectual labor and property? How do we strive to be good allies? Uh, um Song at uh, Calypso Stars tweeted that, quote, too often women of color's ideas uncited or become situated as, quote, raw material, quote, for appropriation, end quote. The bare minimum as at Suman Bong and at Sherman Eyeflower and 
at Jazz, that's, this is a good name, Twitter name, Jazzy Cran discuss is credit, citation, attribution. But we should go further than the bare minimum. Both academics and journalists should ask each individual, individual user on Twitter for consent. They should explain the contents and the usage of their tweets. But these are just very small baselines that replicate the already exploitive terrain of Twitter's iteration with old media. The most useful paradigm is to think about the disruption distributing the, this model entirely. If we want Twitter to be a space for conversation slash ideas, we have to be aware of the uneven distribution of power positions. If we want to transform the space to what we want it to be, we must disrupt the system. We must consider the mythology that skews exploitation, exploitation of digital labor and the structural violence enacted towards women of color, feminist digital bodies. For starters, we all can. One, reject the objective oriented approach. Don't turn women of color into, quote, Objects of, an of analysis, end quote. Refuse the subject slash object divide as explained in, quote, gawking at rape culture, end quote. Women of color narratives, narratives and voice become quickly commodified without consent or permission. The women are objects to be gazed upon and studied. The journalist appropriates, rewrites, and circulates her story, and in this process becomes the speaking subject. A different way to think about the subject slash object is to look to, at the way of Karen Bard, who flattens the subject's dash objective hierarchy from a vertical top to bottom relation to, to one that is horizontal and, and ever shifting, such as the meeting the universe halfway. Her theories of entanglements, especially in the relationship to gender computer program, imagine subject slash objective relationships in a disruptive platform system. Recognizing that journalists, reporters, media companies, professors are not leaders of the analysis, there is no bird's eye view. There's no hierarchical system and linear model production. Instead, production, analysis, discussion must be decentered. As a medium, Twitter is a decentered. That's why gatekeepers, journalists, and conservative Luddites continue to warn us about the dangers of the messy, uncontrollable, fragmented nature of the Twitter conversation. For decentering hierarchies, we can also look at to the models of publication. In European others, querying ethnicity in post-national Europe, Fatem Al-Tabi describes Audrey Lord's interaction with black feminists in Germany. When approached by publishers interested in translating her work, Lord commits them instead to and finalized Afro-German uh, female narratives. As a collection of stories and interviews from women 17 to 70, El Tavi writes that since its inception, showing our colors, Afro-German women speak out has become the key Afro-German text. This example illustrates that while authoritative voices are important to our cultural milieu, sometimes what culture needs most are emergent narratives. A way to make this happen is for the authoritative figure slash acknowledged writer slash center subject to step aside and listen and when necessary, partake in ethical anthologizing of what has been said. 3. Move away from the pyramid to a circular system that values process over product. For journalists and academic enterprises, this means sharing and shuffling the analyst feedback loop so it always quote, allows folks to ask questions to the, to the data themselves. Twitter the tool is not a pyramid, it's circular. Twitter's model makes an authoritative position impossible for anyone who operates within its framework. There is no product for Twitter. It is it deals in information exchange, is foundationally process-based and therefore circular. Why should there be one gatekeeping access point at the top? The current approach journalists have taken, the Twitter, the corporation practices. Instead, we must have multiple points of entry, access, and distribution, a rhizomotic. This is actually a model in folklore studies, but is a rare mythology in most academic research. 4. Allow for the multiplicity of views. We must reject the idea of a uh, quote-unquote expert with regard to women of color Twitter. If we believe in the value of multiplicity of views and narratives, then the system, the analysis, the work should allow for a plurality of views. Thus, hashtag Twitter ethics is about a radically scholarly and journalistic practice that decenters hierarchies by rejecting the, the idea of experts. Instead, it asks for the development of co-creationship, co-authorship. They should collaborate with Twitter users to write their narratives, their analysis, and map their activism and conversation. And five, academics should move towards radical research systems that circulate and open dialogue up to the participatory modes. This is a system that digital humanities particularly have been able to push for with new radical uh, pedagogy and mythologies. Research projects can strive to structure work to break and decenter credit analysis and commentary in order to share and spread it through uh, distributed networks. This sub subverts the top and down gatekeeping pyramid models. And please see the work of Adeline Coe and Root Karzum at hashtag DH 
uh, Poco, um, both academic later and the study and archive work. Radical etymos etymologies. You can't move forward to, the, to new tech with old mythology. That is a re recipe to maintain old power. We must rethink and, re and, con and consider more radical etymologies that will push forward in an ongoing cycle of consent, credit, citation, and participation. Twitter, you're planning your own obsolescence by running on the Ford factory logic, by keeping this out of your archives, by turning our language into property, and making it acceptable for us to be exploited by journalists. In end, the work, the credit, the compensation, the view needed to be shared, collaborative process. Twitter and the new media journalism, the internet and technology involves all of us. The voices on the platform are multiple, collective, dissenting, singular, and loud. You don't need to speak for us. We are talking. Cite us. Ask us to write. Get our permission. And that was written by Dorothy Kim and Un Song Kim. It's called Twitter Ethics Manifesto, and it came out April 7th of 2014. And that is it for the episode. I am disconnecting, and I will see you out on the street. Thank you for listening. Please rate and review either through iTunes or Stitchers or any of the podcasting apps that you're currently using to listen to this show. Thank you, and until next time. This has been a Hiroshima Space Odyssey Network production.